Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Michael Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Lopez. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed. We've got Michael Morrow, Jason Loftus, and Ron Hayes, your host tonight. Well, Jason, what did what did your <laughs> week hold? So my favorite image for the week was um, some wild horse stuff. And I actually think, I think I posted today on my Instagram page, it's Thursday where we're recording this, um, my favorite image that I got. And it's a, it's a great big old stallion out in the West Desert of Utah. And it's just a really cool time of the year to be out there because, you know, for the desert, there's quite a bit of grass and um, some good color. And it was just a perfect day that gave us some, you know, some real good light. Um, I had some diffused light, so I was able to shoot a little bit later than normal. But it was just a, it was a beautiful day. I hadn't really been out much. I'd been out doing some turkey stuff from the vehicle, you know, a couple times and just was really itching to just really get out and get a good day out in the outdoors and recharge my batteries and, you know, work and some other things going on. There's some stressful things going on with all this COVID stuff, like Mike mentioned. And so anyways, trying to, you know, trying to be responsible and trying to stay away from people and that I actually just thought I'd go out and spend the day out there in the West Desert, um, you know, with the feral horses or the wild horses who, you know, they get called both things. There's a herd out there that's, I don't know, it's probably 300 strong or so. And uh, they're pretty easy to find. Um, they're not too far from the main roads out there. And I uh, was just able to go out there and spend the day with them. It was it was just so refreshing. I was telling Mike, him and I were speaking about it a little bit. And I, you know, I got out there right at sunrise and right on the horses right away and just was able to try to do some video and some slow-mo stuff and some photos and just a good mixture of everything. And I even tried to do some um, story stuff too, you know, which is the first time I'd really done much of that kind of vlogging type stuff. And, uh, you know, so it was fun. I had a really good time. Good morning. Sun's starting to get harsh. I don't even know what time it is, to be honest, for sure. All the horses just came to the water trough. And I think I'm going to head back to the car and get some lunch and maybe take a nap. And see what I can come up with this afternoon. But yeah, that was probably my favorite Im favorite image of the week. And part of the reason it was such a powerful image to me was one, I was able to get down in a ditch to shoot him. So I was shooting him from a very low angle and basically at ground level. And the other part was just that because of that, there was a lot of really good depth. I was shooting my, that shot I took with my Nikon D850 and my 500 prime. So you know, at, at F4, that thing just creates some amazing bokeh and some really good depth. I thought it was a pretty cool image, and the horse itself is just beautiful. He's just a great big, I don't even know how to explain, like super, like he looks like he's swole. He looks like Arnold the horse, right? He's just, just, just <laughs> huge. He's just massive in his front end. I mean, this horse is, when you see him compared to a lot of the other horses out there, you'd know what I mean. I mean, he's just that much bigger and that much stockier than the rest of the horses out there. So I kind of cued in on him and spent quite a bit of time with him. But then I also spent some time with a brand new foal that had just been born. And I don't know if it was a foal or a colt, right? It was a baby horse. <laughs> um, but that horse had just been born the night before, had to have. Um, I actually got some video of the horse trying to sit down. And basically he fell down because he just really didn't have his legs about him yet. And got some images of him that I actually posted on the Wild and Exposed page the, today as well. But you could still see the blood on the on the hind quarters of the mom. You could still see the blood on her legs, pretty pronounced from you know giving birth. So you know that happens quite a bit out there. It's not you know as, as every, you guys probably know, horses birth year round. There's no set time. They don't do it, you know, in the spring or the fall or anything like that. It's just a, a continual cycle. Um, and what's interesting about that is I've learned some lessons out there is when you see a horse with a baby uh, or a, a, a female horse with a baby, you you want to kind of cue in on them because the stallions will be paying attention to them. Because I can't remember the exact numbers, but within a week or so, I think. Yeah, they'll um, go back into heat. They'll go back into heat and the stallions will start to try to breed them. Yep. And that's when you're doing photography of the horses, that's a that's a pretty good opportunity because – 
that's you know that creates that tension and those horses those stallions start fighting a little bit and you know you know trying to decide who's going to actually get the right to breed her so um anyways the other reason you want to key in on that is their gestation period is almost exactly a year so you know to you know be back and and horses are a little bit easier to identify even the wild horses yeah uh the individuals because their color patterns and and that kind of thing yeah so you know make yeah. a mental note or make a written note write it down on a calendar and come back out she may have another one there, there was quite a few i think i was with the group i was with um and i wasn't the whole group i think there were some bands that were off doing their own thing elsewhere too but this big group that i was with there was probably 150 head of horses in this big group and i think there was five or six you know young young baby horses mm-hmm. so you know that's a pretty good ratio and and uh you know, they're, they're just, they're pretty cute, man. They're pretty fun to hang out with and that. And they, they've all got personalities and you can definitely pick up, you know, there's usually a bully stallion or two that just run around and start fights with everybody. And then there's, you know, the ones that are older ones like this one I posted on my page today. I think he was an older, wiser stallion that just kind of knew there was nothing to fight about right now. And he was just kind of chilling and, you know, soaking up the sun, so to speak, and just like letting the other horses do their thing and not really worrying too much. But you know, you can tell he's the kind of horse that when it's time for business, he'll he'll step in and, you know, take charge, so to speak. But, but yeah, pretty pretty fun day. Well, I've seen a lot of the footage that we're going to put in the show. And if anybody's watching this on YouTube, you're seeing it now. But it just looked like so much fun. I mean, it's one of those things, right, that we all love shooting big game. Mm-hmm. And this kind of replaces that for this time of year. Yep. And then, like you said, all these little bands of horses kind of have their own personalities and the stallions have their personalities. You can tell the, like the lead mare, mm-hmm. and she kind of runs the deal or runs a lot of the other, the rest of the herd. And then you got all these little ones, and the amount of like tussling and fighting that you got on video, both with mm-hmm. young horses and like not necessarily adult, maybe mature horses, but they're not super old. Uh, yeah. Is my assumption. I mean, they just look like really young horses, but mm-hmm. man, they're full of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think you and I talked a little bit about that, but I think part of the, and I don't know, I don't know, I've never really photographed horses anywhere else, you know, I've never had the opportunity, and I know there's a lot of other places to do it, you can go to Nevada, you can go to Colorado, you can go to Montana, you can go, there's a lot of places that have, you know, quote unquote wild horses or feral horses, and um, it's Arizona, you know, there's quite a few down that way too, Um, but I think the thing that makes this band or this group of horses so much fun to shoot is and the, and you see so much of the activities because the resources are just so limited, and um, I think that's why they're easy to find is because they're hanging out by water resources and there's not a ton of water resources out there, and so you can see at this time of year it's not so bad because there's there's plenty of water right now, but I've photographed these horses in July, and that literally was only one water hole that had any water in it at all. And the whole group of horses in that area was coming to that water hole. And it was the most amazing day I ever had photographing. But it was because that every single time a new horse would come into that water hole, there was a fight over who was going to actually get to drink first. And so as this line of horses come in, and they just kept coming, kept coming, and kept coming. And I actually shared that experience with my son Hunter and a friend of mine, Terry Hansen. And as those horses just kept coming, we sat there for probably an hour and a half and literally watch this interaction and, you know, figuring out who was going to get to drink first. And by the time the last few horses were coming into the water hole, the water hole was drained. It was empty. And so it was just, it really hit me about how, 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 why that was such a big deal. You know, these, these horses are literally deciding who's going to get to drink and who's not ultimately, you know, because it was a, a well, a spring, and they had t- they had tapped into it, and the horses there was so much horse demand that the the well wasn't filling it up as fast as they were drinking. So the last horse that was taken to drink, I literally and I think I took an image of it. I'll have to look and see if I did, and I'll send it to you, Mike. But the last horse that was getting a drink was literally taking drops out of the pipe to to get any water. So you know there, and I I don't I won't go down a the whole path of that because there's a whole bunch of (laughs) there's a whole bunch behind that right this is not this is a very controversial subject for a lot of people in a lot of different ways but and we don't need to go there necessarily but but there's just a reality to it that you know that's how that's why they were fighting so much and that's why there was so much tussling and you know those horses out there a lot of the big stallions have chunks of their hide hanging 
that they've been bitten in fighting and or their hooves have been kicked them and they've torn skin open and you can see where they've got scars all over their bodies and it's it's all from that it's all about fighting for resources i really believe you know so it's crazy the footage you sent me i mean you got horses biting each other and it's more of like a it's not like a serious fight but man they're they're jumping down on each other i mean it can't feel good that's for sure yeah Huh. Yeah, I never thought you would imagine in July, it's hot in the desert yeah. in Utah. I mean, that water is their most precious resource out of anything. Wow. Yep. And and as the, you know, because that land is, you know, it's BLM land and it's shared with, you know, multiple critters. You know, there's antelope that live out there. There's cattle that the Cattlemen Association runs out there. Um, so that there's, you know, there's some grazing rights out there. Um, and then you've got these horses as well. And then there's also, you know, rabbits and all other kinds of little critters that run around out there and birds and metal larks and horned larks and all kinds of stuff, burrowing owls. You know, the desert's full of life. But, when you know, this time of year, it's it's beautiful. But you get to July. And on that day, I went with the, Terry and my son, Hunter. We went out there first thing in the morning. We were having a hard time finding the horses. We couldn't find them. And we didn't find them till it was like noon. We were going to – we were like giving up. We were making one more pass. And we, it just happened to be looking, and I saw this big string and a dust cloud just probably a mile out. And I pulled over and threw up the binoculars, and here they all are. And we didn't know where they had been, but you could tell they were headed to this water hole. And so we booked it down to the water hole and got in place. And we ended up – so it was like noon to 1.30 is when we had our shoot. So it was the worst light of the day. It was 105 degrees is what it read on my car. It was dusty as I'll get out, hot as I'll get out. And these horses were just more active than you've ever seen, you know, even more than more active than critters you'd see on a, you know, a cool fall morning when, you know, you'd think there's, you know, there's no heat to fight and there's plenty of, you know, water and that they're, they're healthy and that all that, whatever, like, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but these guys were just, they was not, they weren't playing, they weren't play biting these, every single horse that came in, you'd have their little bands and the stallion of that band would fight with the stallion from the other band. And it was all about, okay, I'm not done drinking yet. You stay there. Or, yeah, you are done drinking. Get out of the way. It's my turn. You know, and it was all about who's going to win that battle. And then you'd see that stallion come in with, the, with their mares and they would, you know, drink or whatever. And the other horses would hang out in the outskirts a little bit waiting for their turn. And then you could see if they were getting impatient, then the stallions might start having a discussion. You know, it was just, it was, in, it was really interesting to watch and see for sure the dynamics of it, you know, but. Sorry, I could go on about it for hours probably. No, I mean, I've only <laughs> photographed wild horses for maybe four or five or six different times. And just in that amount of time, you can see those discussions. I mean, you start picking up on that very quickly that there's definitely a hierarchy. There's definitely competition. There's definitely, you know, you got your outcast. Every horse has their own personality. I mean, you can come up with names for them super fast because... You, they just present this personality that's like, oh, you know, there's whatever. Just because, you know, they just represent that. It's yeah. so dynamic. It's so cool to watch. Yeah. Yeah, and these horses are, you know, as most of the horses are, they're pretty well photographed. You know, there's a lot of people that go out there and spend time with them. And there's some local photographers here that get out there quite a bit. And there's some amazing images out there of, you know, these horses. Um, but what's cool is this is like the perfect thing to go do on a in a situation that we're in right now, because even if there's other photographers out there, you know, I did it on a weekday. So I wasn't hoping I wasn't going to be running into a bunch of other people. And I'm planning actually on going out there again tomorrow um, and spending the day with Hunter and myself um, to go out there and, you know, spend, spend another day with them. But the cool thing is you probably won't run into a lot of other people that are really interested in photographing them. You might have people that see them drive by, stop, get out with their cell phone, you know, take some photos, sit and watch them for a minute, but then they're off doing their own thing or doing something else. So, you know, that desert out there gets used quite a bit. A lot of people go out there and camp and ride their four-wheelers and side-by-sides this time of year. It's a great resource for a lot of reasons. And these horses are just kind of always out there. But there is there is a group of people that photograph them pretty consistently. But it's something you can do to get out there and get away from the crowds and just kind of have your own time. And, and for me, you know, like my favorite part of the day was coming back to the car after the morning and I got to shoot till about 11 o'clock because, I, like I said, I had some clouds come in and it gave me some pretty good diffuse light. But it was great to go back to the car and then just kind of go and find me a little hidey hole. I actually drove clear up into the foothills and found some junipers and found this old campsite off of a two-track. And I just found me a little shady spot and I rolled the window down and, 
you know, I turned the radio on in the car and I grabbed my little travel pillow and laid my head back and took me a nice little nap, woke up about an hour later, refreshed, you know, grabbed me some water and a quick, you know, bite. And it was about time to go back out and start, you know, seeing what they were doing and seeing where they were and, you know, what the evening was going to look like. But, but yeah, so yeah, just a great way to, to spend some time and to recharge your batteries given the circumstances, you know. So one thing I'll talk about maybe just a little bit too, just for folks that might be thinking about it, is actually maybe maybe my setup and that and what I was shooting. Yeah, um, good idea. Because I I did go out with um, some things in mind. I was really trying to, I had my phone with me, like I mentioned, I was trying to do some little bit of, of vlog and stuff, and I was trying to tell the story a little bit. And I had my my Miller head on my video head for my Nikon D850 and my 500 Prime. And I have a Rode mic on that that I can use to try to get some sound and audio. And then I also had my Sony on me as well with a strap um, around my shoulder. So I had both options with me all the time. That's kind of a lot to haul around. And actually that morning, those horses took me on about a, I figured it was probably about a three mile loop, you know, I actually tracked it on my phone. Um, but, but, you know, it's all rolling heel. It's not a big deal. It's a great, it's great walk. Great. You know, you just get out and do it, but hauling that gear around, it's a, it's a good little way to get out and do a little bit of exercise. But, um, anyways, they took me on about a three mile loop by the time I got back to the car. And the, the, the beautiful thing about having that set up the way I was doing it, I think was I could do some video and I could also be taking stills at the same time. If I had something going on that was far enough away, I could set up the camera, I could roll some video, and I could also take stills of something else that was going on. It's a little hard to do. I, granted, I do, I admit that, but it can be done. And the cool thing is, is with that two to 600, I could zoom all the way back out to 200 and be prepared for anything that might be happening up close. Cause you just never know where they're gonna be. And a lot of times they'll start rough house and then they'll start running towards you and with your 500 prime, you know, you're just, you're, it is what it is. But if they start doing that, I can just whip out, you know, I can pull up my two to six and at 200 and get the whole thing in frame and do some, some steals that way. So, so tomorrow I'm definitely going to be trying to focus a little bit more on, you know, kind of same setup. I'll have Hunter with me to help do some video stuff. I think, um, to let him, you know, have some fun with his GoPro and to maybe run the video camera. Um, and that'll help quite a bit, but then trying to get some audio as well. And there's so much out there, like I mentioned, like the metal larks and the horn larks and the other stuff that's out there that's going on. And the horses, they're very vocal. They make, you know, a lot of noise. They make a lot of sound. Um, so anyways, just kind of some food for thought on what my setup was and maybe my thought process and why I was, you know, carrying all that gear around. You know, A, it was not too bad to carry it all around and B, I wasn't too far from the car. You know, if even if I did get taken on a three mile loop, it wasn't a big deal. It was, you know, I'm not too far from um, my car to get back to it and have to haul all that wet stuff around because that Miller tripod with the Miller video head and that Nikon D850 and a 500, I think it weighs about 28 pounds, you know, so on your shoulder all day long, that's, you know, it, it gets old after a bit, trust me, but, <laughs> but it's worth it with, you know, I know Mike knows, Mike knows for sure what that's all about because I think his system's heavier than that, but <laughs> you just learn how to switch shoulders. Yeah, I do that a lot too. So, yeah. <laughs> No, that's awesome. There are, like you said, there's plenty of opportunities in the West with a bunch of different states to get these horses. So yep, you can yep. always look up. Is this something that they advertise like on BLM sites or something? I don't even know. Yeah, they they do. Yeah, they, they've got that information out there. Yeah. But it's like you said too, Jason. I've been to, there's a couple of spots that I've hit here. I've had really good success at one. And the other one, they say there's horses, but I've been there and I've never never found them i mean it's like you said earlier you could go you almost you guys almost left that one day just because you can spend three or four or five hours and yep. they're just not around it helps to you know get in contact with some of the other local photographers that do spend time with them um, because that was a that was a big help for me i mean i'd have found these ones they were right off the main road i'd have found them pretty quick i think but sometimes they just seem to be tend to hang in a different area where they're not super visible and if you are you know if you know somebody that does go out there and spends time with them then just you know reach out to them and i'm sure they're more than likely to just you know yeah they were here you know two days ago and if they're there in that area within the last couple of days they're more than likely going to be in the same general area so another pointer all right you guys have anything else i don't think i do as always thanks for listening and we'll see you next time on wild and exposed You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. 
and make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Sing along to the radio. We're gonna make it someday. Nothing's gonna get in our way.